Caregivers, have you ever felt like nothing? I mean, nothing is going right? Well, cheer up, and welcome to Dave the Caregiver's Caregiver radio program, where you'll learn how to avoid that dreaded thing called caregiver burnout and how to survive the grief process. You know, with roughly 100 million caregivers in the U.S. and Canada alone, that's about a third of the population. That means that everyone probably knows someone caring for a loved one. Join Dave and his guests now and every Wednesday at noon Pacific time as they discuss avoiding caregiver burnout and surviving grief. So find a comfortable place to relax, kick up your feet, and prepare to feel better and to receive practical tips and tools that you can start using immediately to get you through today and every day so you can survive your tomorrows. But not just survive, but to live life fully and abundantly. Yes, you heard me right. That is a possible goal to achieve. And now, here's your host, Dave Nassani. My God. In Los Angeles, a big LA welcome to all my listeners out there in Radio Land. I'm Dave, the caregiver's carrier, caregiver. Got marbles in my mouth. Uh, worldwide Blog Talk Radio Network, as well as seven other audio and video platforms, and iTunes and YouTube where all our recorded uh, podcasts and video casts are saved for your later on-demand listening pleasure. And I am in Roanco, Virginia today, promoting my new book on television. And so I'm a little uh, out of uh, place, like a fish out of water. Now I know how fish feel when they're out of water. I'm in this <laughs> place echoing, and so you know I'm not in my studio. But we have an exciting show planned for you today anyway. I have a wonderful guest, Stephanie Howard, and she is an author, and she is a director, and she's directing a film, and we'll get to that later. Let's just continue with our introduction here. Welcome, Adrian, first of all, and uh, thank you. And Hi. Welcome, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. It's great to I, be here. Yes, I am your host, Dave Nassani, and this show is to caregivers of every single kind, so welcome all you care caregivers out there. And the one thing we know about caregivers is that they are caring and selfless and sacrificial souls, but they all have this tiny little problem. You see, they're very prone to burnout because they tend to put everyone else's needs above their own. And you can actually learn something from the airlines because they tell us that the event of an emergency to put your oxygen mask on first, because they know that if you don't put your needs first, you're going to burn out. I mean, it's just that simple. So we also talk about grief and loss here and the devastating effects they can have on us. It throws us into this thing called the grief process, which could take days or weeks or months or years to get out of. Gosh, some people never seem to get out of it. But that's not good. And I know everyone has their own grief uh, process and grieve in their own way and in their own timing. But, you know, it's probably not good after several years to continue grieving. So if you feel like you're um, kind of stuck in your grief, we can help you get through it kind of quickly. So I do want to take this time and thank my last week's guest, um, Raul. And I'll have to find his last name. I'm kind of out of sorts here because I'm out of town in a hotel room's computer lab. So give me some grace here. <laughs> but just a reminder, you can listen to that wonderful interview <laughs> and all of ours on our website, caregiverscaregiver.com. And we are so excited that my new book is out and I'm just on the road what seems like every week, just either catching a bus or a plane or a plane. I mean, I meant, I meant to say a train, not a plane twice. And uh, those long drives from city to city, uh, now I know how it feels to be a traveling salesman. <laughs> but the fun is when you actually get on the uh, uh, cameras and, and you tell your story. So uh, it's called It's My Life Too, uh, Reclaim Your Caregiver Sanity by Learning When to Say Yes and When to Say No. And the segment that I basically do is how to, how to avoid – uh, your loved one's illness from actually killing you because we know that out of the 65 million caregivers who are unpaid in the U.S., that about 30 percent of them actually die before their loved ones do. And the lucky ones who who live, well, they become sicker than the ones they're caring for, and they just need a caregiver of their own eventually. So it's a sad, sad situation. And if I was Elton John, I would actually sing that line. Stephanie, why don't you take a minute or two and introduce yourself? I always like to ask my guests just who the heck is Stephanie and why was she put on this earth? 
So what I uh, have done is I am the producer and director and writer of a film called The Weight of Honor. And it's about the caregivers of our catastrophically wounded veterans who've come back with injuries from Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's been a film that was five years in the making. We're just releasing now on iTunes and Amazon and also in film festivals and for screenings. And it's about these amazing five women who have stepped up without knowing what's go what would be coming to them and they've stepped up to care for their loved one and i think the difference that you see from maybe some of your guests is that most four of the women are very very young they were married young one of them at, at least one of them was pregnant when mm. her husband was injured and Another one had just given birth. The baby was maybe two weeks old. So what we're seeing and, and part of the discussion is not only are we looking at caregivers in the civilian world who are perhaps caregiving later in life um, for people who are more elderly. Sorry, I've had a cold. And, <laughs> but we also need to broaden that view and look at families who are very, very young. What we're showing in the film is, and what actually one of the experts says, that we're looking at perhaps decades of yeah. caregiving with these families, right. which could be very different than what a lot of people think of as caregivers. I think most people right now think of someone who's taking care of their parents or a family member who's elderly, maybe with dementia or Alzheimer's, and you can correct me here, Dave, mm -hmm. but we're now looking at very, very young families who, as right. people who are listening, didn't sign up for this, but now they're taking care of a husband or a son, plus babies, small children, a larger family, like, you know, mind blowing. Yeah. The savage um, generation. I think that that uh, uh, certainly on my site uh, we deal with all caregivers of all ages uh, because we have parents of children with disabilities, so they've got a lifetime ahead of them as well as as the the young veterans coming home. So uh, we recognize we recognize everyone who's caring, not just the elderly. Yeah, and veterans, of course, uh, are the special ones who seem to have their unfair share of post-traumatic stress syndrome. I mean, we hear stories about um, uh, veterans coming home and, and pulling a gun on their wife and, you know, actually killing sometimes their spouse. And, and it's just a sad, sad situation. I said, you know, my gosh, what happened you know, to you guys over there, you know? Yeah, I, I think that those stories are very, very much um, – out of the norm. We don't see a lot of that happening. I think because it's it's something that gets a lot of media attention when it happens and you know I'm I'm part of the media, I'm a journalist, so maybe I'm a little embarrassed to say that. But because those stories are so extraordinary, I think we're getting more attention on that. Um, you know, we we see the really visible wounds. We see the amputations, um, severe burns, um, maybe, you know, limb salvage. And then we see, of course, what you were just talking about, the invisible wounds, as we've been hearing a lot of, for the PT, PTSD, um, and then traumatic brain injury, which is TBI. Oh, and wow. when we think about, you know, you because we have a volunteer military, we have 1% of the population who has volunteered. That's why you were seeing numerous deployments of the same people. Right. I mean, I don't know if you remember. I mean, I was a little kid, but during Vietnam, if someone went on a tour of duty and then that was it. If someone went for two tours, that was really unusual. That's what my memory is. But we're seeing now in this war, which is now our longest war, you know, 
two, three, four, five, six deployments. Yeah. And all those explosions and all, there's a lot going on with their brains and the traumatic injury. I'm sorry, my phone just rang. Ravaged. That's okay. And I, th I think ravaged is the right word, but uh, it it it's a it is a sad sad situation. Uh, <laughs> Elton is popular today. Yeah, I mean it is. It's a terrible situation. But you know, um, statistically, you're right. I shouldn't know anybody, but my niece. Uh, was in the military, and she met her husband there, and they married, and they came back, and and he tried to kill her. So that's, you know, it personally touched my life, mm. and and as rare as it may be, wow. so so maybe it gave me a jaded opinion of how how. Oh, how I'm sorry. There. I I am so sorry for that. That that well, just resonates. She, thankfully, he wasn't successful. You know, she's a fast runner. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. You know, and. It was I in Afghanistan. Been a lot of a lot of bad stuff happens in yeah. Afghanistan. Apparently, you know what kind yeah. of nerve gas uh, and and people are still suffering from Agent Orange and those things back in Vietnam. Vietnam, you know, sure. You, know, you just don't know well, what, what we're you're seeing, supposed to. Yeah, what we're seeing in um, with TBI is that a lot of it doesn't show up until right. later, right. and it progresses, and it's. It's very, very difficult because you don't, we don't know and we won't really see maybe for years or a, no. another generation what the impact of that is going to be. I mean, you talk about Agent Orange and then we're seeing, yeah. you know, how the children of Vietnam vets um, and emotional issues, those children are impacted even as adults. And we don't know what's going to be happening with those children coming back. From out of families where there have been, you know, traumatic injuries. Mm. But besides wanting to bring attention to the issue and attention to these families and these really brave women, I wanted to show that they're very courageous and there are inspiring stories coming out of this. And I mm -hmm. think that's really critical. And what you find is um, we tell we're sort of the vehicle for their stories and we meet them and we get to know them mm -hmm. but we also can see how they've how they're overcoming because as you know caregiving isn't really something where okay we're done <laughs> we, got to, we got to the point <laughs> and yeah. it's all better now nice. right yeah. So right. I'm, I'm curious, Stephanie, how did you decide on military? I mean, do you have a military family or were you in the military? Why, why did you do this uh, and why the military? Um, you know, it's not just that I was looking for a story in the military. What I'm always on the look, look out for are stories that people don't, things people don't know about mm -hmm. and things that I can research and then explain and show. So the way this came about is um, a friend of mine who lives really close by wow. and has her own nonprofit had uh, a group of injured vets coming to speak at our local junior high and high schools. Oh. And actually Dave Valencia High, which you probably know, <laughs> yes. and um, my one of my sons was a high school student there, and then another one was at the junior high school where they talked, they spoke, and it was very effective. They didn't come and talk about being wounded in war. They came and spoke about what it's like to be different and how to be different in your community and how to be accepting and how people need to understand that you may look different, which yeah. I thought was very interesting don't you think well yeah. i have i have a question um i know that there are uh there are military families who are still living on bases military bases where the the wives really have a support system structure going on with these with the vets that you uh th that you were filming the families in their homes were any on still on military bases no. Yeah, that was my question. How do you find your no. subject, Stephanie? Well, you know, it takes a bit of research. And 
what I found is that most of the nonprofit organizations, most of the support organizations, most of these caregivers are on Facebook. And they Everybody's find support. Right, yeah. right. So you know that, you know, it's two or three in the morning and you're awake and mm -hmm. you're coping with things. And who, who can you talk to? Who can be supportive? Who can you sort of unload on? Will you go on Facebook and Generally, there's someone else in the same boat who's sure. there. And what I did was I um, explained who I was to some of the organizers of some of these groups and started a relationship with them and asked them, hey, do you do you know of some caregivers who might be willing to be part of this film? That's great. Or I went to, you know, I phoned up mm -hmm. caregiver support groups. And it took sometimes layers and layers of people to finally get to someone who said, yeah, I know some families, let me check with them and see if they'd want to participate. Because as you can imagine, yeah, do, do you want a camera crew coming in? And every single one of the people we interviewed said, yes, I agree to do this because I want people to know that what I'm doing here and I want recognition for military caregivers. As yeah. much as there may be for the service members, right. the families need recognition. Yep. Yeah, well, that's why I'm out here killing myself because not enough recognition or awareness is is coming to caregivers, you know, the and, government. And not, not only the uh, veteran caregivers, yeah, you know, we, we really concentrate on, on all caregivers. Yeah. It, it, we're all underserved. Yeah, and, and you were pretty you were pretty modest, Stephanie. When I asked you to introduce yourself, you didn't mention that you have a 25 year career as a broadcast news producer. And, and she uh, has an Emmy. A couple, I think. Well, I see it. <laughs> and has produced <laughs> do some specials and documentaries <laughs> for <laughs> CNN and Fox News, and so you're pretty famous. And you know, we just have a a modest little broadcast thing here. So uh, you're really the expert uh, broadcaster here. So congratulations. No, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, you know, I, for a long time, I've wanted to be behind the camera. I didn't want to be in the front. And I find that to be much more rewarding. And to be able to um, kind of transition from doing daily news where I had maybe um, a minute 10 or 30 seconds to tell a story yeah. this was yeah. a great transition just as you have you know you have an hour-long opportunity to really discuss an issue and to have a guest and this gave me an opportunity to really go much deeper into the story yeah well let's take a quick break uh, so we'll be right back don't go away Now, taking care of loved ones can be difficult. Here to share his story and how he can help you take better care of your loved ones is David Nassani, and joining him is his wife, Charlene. Hi, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for having me. All the way from Santa Clarita. Yes. All the way. We love it. Beautiful faces. Again, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, take a minute to tell myself and the viewers a bit about what brought you to this point. Well, this is my wife, Charlene. She's beautiful, mm -hmm. and we've been married 42 wonderful years. Wow. But 21 years ago, uh, something happened. She had a headache, the headache of her life, she said. She wanted to uh, call Dr. Kevorkian to put her out of her mis misery. It was that bad. But uh, to make a long story short, she had a stroke, massive stroke, that resulted in her being speech impaired and paralyzed on the right side. Mm -hmm. And we went through a couple of uh, years of, of hell for the grief process. But as a result of all of that, I learned that there's a lot of other caregivers out there. I made a lot of mistakes. I wanted to teach them and show them what not to do. So I became Dave the Caregiver's Caregiver. And so I host a, a podcast uh, to uh, caregivers that is called uh, Dave the Caregiver's Caregiver. And I'm also a best-selling author on Amazon. It's uh, My Life 2, Reclaim, Reclaim Your Caregiver Sanity by Learning when to say yes mm -hmm. and when to say no. Get a close up of that real quick. So you're you're needed. I am needed. Yeah. You are very yeah. much needed. I am you're needed. kind of one of a kind, yes. right? Yep. Yes. Wow, this is fascinating. Uh, so tell me this, because I'm kind of green in this department. How many caregivers are taking care of their loved ones? Oh, well, Brian, there's about 
over 65 yeah. million adults in the U.S. who are unpaid yeah. caregiving, caregivers. Mm -hmm. And uh, this includes celebrities like uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, The Fonz, Henry Winkler, uh, Hillary Clinton, and Queen Latifah. And even they are not immune yeah. from uh, allowing or preventing their uh, uh, loved one's illness from actually killing them. Because yeah. that's, that's the title of what I'm here today. You know, we want to, about a third of the caregivers actually die before their loved ones do. And those that don't become sicker than the ones they're caring for. And they, they actually need a caregiver themselves. So this well, is You're blowing my mind right now. Yeah. <laughs> my sister's a caregiver to my niece. So, oh, so okay. what's interesting about this is it, it's not even one degree of separation. This affects everybody, right? <laughs> yes, you yes, know, yes. I say there's three kinds of people in the world. You're either a caregiver, you're going to become a caregiver, or you're going to need a caregiver. So there's there no go. escaping it. Yeah, there isn't. Wow. What are three biggest mistakes caregivers should avoid? Well, the first mistake, here yeah, I'm going to use this prop here. I, I tried to get an airline uh, oxygen mask, but they said I needed to be uh, a Medicare recipient. <laughs> Why don't you try to put that on? And this will explain, you know, the airlines tell us in the event of an emergency, put your oxygen mask on first okay. before you attempt to help your loved ones with their mask. Okay. So you see, this will help your viewers <laughs> see that unless you take care of your needs first, you can't take care of your loved ones. Ah, so the second there's mistake, a rhyme and reason to this. Go ahead. The second mistake, do you have a cell phone? I do. Well, use it. Call your brother. Call your sister. Call mm -hmm. your uh, wife's ex-husband. Mm -hmm. Call your kids, whoever. Caregivers need to ask for help. You see, there's something about caregivers that uh, asking for help makes them feel like a failure as a caregiver. Uh, you know, I should be able to do this myself. No, I don't need any help. Yeah. And then believe it or not, people come up and say, hey, is there anything I can do to help? And they say, no, I got it. You know, no, pull out a notepad and say, well, yes, actually, on Friday at 3 o'clock, I could use someone to go to the grocery store. Yeah. Oh, I'm busy at 5. Oh, well, then Saturday at, at 2 o'clock, I've got, no, no, no. Well, Sunday, don't let him off the hook. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The next thing you can do is, uh, here, put your hand in that. So we got to wrap it up. You've oh. got to... Uh, You've got to not let guilt affect your decisions. Mm -hmm. See, it's like being handcuffed to somebody. Mm -hmm. And uh, guilt will actually kill you. See, this is more reason for you to uh, order this book, folks. Uh, the information was just popped up. Uh, you can find the Kindle version of uh, this book for 99 cents on Amazon. No excuses. A big thanks to these two for stopping by. A big thanks to you. Yeah. That does it for us today. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. And I'm, and I'm keeping it. And we're back with Stephanie Howard and Adrian Gruberg. So guys, um, that was my very first interview and I, apparently I've come a long way because I don't <laughs> stutter and stammer as much I as I I thought it was pretty to. good. And your well, wife looks lovely. Your wife oh, looks she, absolutely lovely. She just makes us normal people look like whiners and complainers. Uh, anytime I go out with her, I have to like overdress just to to not look like a bum, you know. <laughs> you need a stylist. We all need a stylist, right? She's got it. Yeah. So you're going to like the last one. Uh, if you think that one's good, you'll just love the new ones. Anyway, <laughs> um, Stephanie, was there any reluctance from, from them to open up their lives to you? I mean, you mentioned that they just says, no, come on in. And and how did you just win their trust? I mean, because you are kind of a stranger coming to their house. But Well, you know, you're a stranger coming into houses sometimes. <laughs> and people accept you and they listen to you. Uh, yeah. You know, we talk some on the phone, obviously. I don't try to do a big pre-interview. Mm -hmm. uh, they already knew because of the contacts. I absolutely yeah. would not call anyone cold. They already knew what they were getting into. And, you know, when the crew is setting up lights and that kind of thing, we sort of chat. And I, it was an extension of my phone calls and us chatting before that. And yeah. I try to make them feel comfortable. And, you know, they... Like I said, they already knew what they were getting into. That sounds terrible. But I, more than no. anything, they were, well, getting into it. But they really wanted to tell their stories. And I said to, to them, because every single one of the people, women I interviewed just broke down and was just sobbing. You know, they're crying, I'm crying. I hear the camera crew in back of me going... <laughs> And, you know, I yeah, after the camera was off, oh, and I'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to get you upset with this. I'm, I'm just trying to ask the questions. And they said, that's it. No one has ever asked me 
Wow. How I feel. They're always right. asking my husband. They're always asking my son, but they don't ask me. And yep. it became something that was cathartic for them because they were able to kind of unload in front of my camera. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what's different about military caregivers as opposed to other caregivers? Well, I don't know. I think you can speak to that better than I can um, because I – I guess I have my parents who are older, but I'm not caring for them on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't live with me or even in my town. But I think the biggest difference is we're looking at a very young community. We're looking at people who, you know, had children and a career maybe, which a lot of your listeners already had, but maybe they were in college, maybe, um, pregnant and I think that that's what's different and you know it was a I'm big eye opener to me one of my radio guests uh, about a year ago was a woman who just had a storybook relationship you know her and her husband got married fell in love and and he went off to Afghanistan and when he came back he was a different man and and he would wake up in the middle of the night with cold sweats and like you know puncher i mean not on purpose of course but uh after a while you know he he just felt so bad about himself that he 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 left you know she was willing to work in the marriage but he was not and he just started drinking and drugs and and you know carousing and and the marriage didn't have any hope at all but then you know she just wouldn't give up this was a wife who loved her husband she wanted her husband back and as a result of not giving up uh you know, today they have a ministry to caregivers who have post-traumatic stress and they concentrate strictly on, on the military. And uh, that just proves to me that, that anything is possible, you know. And, and as she was telling me the story, I was saying to myself, this marriage doesn't have a chance. <laughs> but I was wrong. Um, I, just, I just wanted to say something that the, the caregivers sometimes end up with post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. Um, and that's not talked about very much. But they do. You're, you're right. In the in the film we do, and uh, the the experts who we have in the film do talk about that, and they talk about it. And then, as you see the interviews, you can kind of you can see some of that happening. And one of the big things that that is brought up is that the when you have a relationship you know, husband and wife relationship. And then suddenly the wife is put in a position where she's not only a caregiver, but she's, you know, around the clock nurse. She's dressing wounds and, you know, taking care of things that a lot of us don't want to think about. And so how do you keep that husband wife relationship going when the wife is comes, it looks more and more like a nurse. And yeah. That's something that these people have to work on. Um, some of these couples have been successful. Some have not. Yeah, and you that's know. not only for veterans. I mean, there's spousal caregivers. My wife mm -hmm. had a stroke, you know, and anytime you're married to your loved one and you're caring for them, that drastically changes your marital relationship. But, you know, sometimes but not it, always for the better, but. It can increase intimacy, though. Yes. Yes. So that's it's it's something that is actually um, being studied um, by the Rand Corporation has done some studies on that. Uh, you have uh, educators at USC, University of Southern California, and they're looking at that and they're bringing that into what they're practicing when they're doing counseling with these families, with these couples, and that this is a very big concern. And the fact that it's such a big concern, I think gives recognition. I mean, it gives, it, it gives me hope that this is an issue that's not being ignored, mm -hmm. you know, even on a national level when they're looking at issues of caregiving. Yeah. What is your hope to uh, accomplish with this film? I mean, what do you, what would make you feel wonderful? Yes, I did it. We succeeded. Well, we started out that we wanted to bring awareness, like you've, you've talked about. And I think that 
we I know that we are still see that as a goal, but as we thought we were wrapping up the film, more and more was happening with these families and, and we needed to follow those stories and follow that arc. And we learned so much more. And I think that that also gives something to the civilian audience. Mm -hmm. I think more than anything, the civilian audience needs to understand about this segment of our population. You know, we have 1% of our population that went to war and I don't have the exact statistic in front of me of how many came back wounded. And a lot of people, we don't know. They're not reporting right. it or they, they don't realize it. But we do know that there are 1.2 million military caregivers, and that's post 9-11. Over all wars, we're looking at 5.5 million mm -hmm. caregivers. And that's not all, that's military caregivers. So... I don't think the civilian audience is aware of that, and I want to bring that awareness, but I also want to bring recognition for these women to and women. to start the discussion, start the discussion. Okay, how can I as an individual help? What kind of action can I take as an individual? Can we bring this film to a screening in our community, have a discussion about it? What can our community do to help with those who we need to support and you know you're saying okay we thank we'll think of that for a service or a, a woman for her service but are we thanking the caregivers are we thanking the family members are we are we giving them the emotional support and i, I want to kick start that conversation and also start the conversation as, as i said before that let's look at this on a broad basis. This isn't just, you know, an age group. This is a broad age group that is caregiving. And here we have a very, very young population that we need to include in that discussion. So this is, is this a full featured movie? A couple of hours? What is this? It's considered a feature because it's 56 minutes. Usually a short is a short film is considered anything 20 minutes or, or less. Mm -hmm. How will it be distri distributed? Uh, on iTunes and Amazon and can, you know, check for that. Um, release November 7th. And also uh, we're in some film festivals, the Kansas International Film Festival, the Alexandria, Virginia Film Festival, and the San Francisco Veterans Film Festival. Ooh. Those are all coming up. And also can go to our website and uh, purchase the video there. But also on our website, you can click on host a screening, which is on our front page, and bring a screening to your community or to your school or your church or your synagogue or your mosque, you know, anywhere where there might be a group of people who could really, really benefit from understanding. So this is a film that you would love all caregivers, regardless of uh, whether they're veterans or not, to, to see. Uh, are you doing any other advertising um, to the caregiver community other than what you're doing here? Well, we do have podcasts. We're very happy to partner with any caregiver group, no matter what the age. You know, we're just on rollout now. The film just was completed in the last four months. And, you know, I, I'm certainly happy to begin that process. Right now, we're like I said, we're rolling out the film. And as we do that, then we can open ourselves up. We're, we're open now. I shouldn't say we can. I shouldn't say in the future. We're open now to participate in that. Yeah, well, we're excited to share it for you because, you know, it helps us all. I'm excited to share it, too, when I can. <laughs> like I said we. <laughs> well, so Facebook, you're, in New York. You know. you're in New York, mm -hmm. and we'd love to screen the film in New York. And have you come and be part of the Q&A after? Wouldn't that be cool? That would be and nice. That now, would be awesome. I don't know if you're aware of it, but um, Denise Brown, who is uh, caregiving.com, she has a big um, event coming up. Uh, when is it, Adrian? The 8th? Uh, of, uh, like, yeah, about. I don't know. I'm not going this year. It's it's uh, <laughs> on a weekend. So I think, I think you'd have to double check, but I think it's November 8th and 9th. I think so. 
if that's on a Friday and a Saturday. And that's in Chicago because that's where her home base. So maybe you need to contact her and um, gosh, uh, maybe there can be a, a workshop. I don't know. I'm, I'm not speaking right. for her for, or anything. Probably but. for next year. She's probably next booked year. up for this year. And we're exactly. it, actually – But at least um, we can that, talk about it. That Friday – Friday is November 10th, which is we will actually have our first Southern California premiere at oh. the uh, Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum. So that's part of their Veteran Day activity. So we're really excited about yeah. that. And that's then that's great. You got to come down. <laughs> I do have a book. Down. I have if, a book signing on on uh, Saturday, uh, Veterans Day. So we'll see what we can do. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Where's the book signing? It's in your neighborhood. It's at the Barnes & Noble in Valencia, on Valencia and Magic okay. Mountain. Between okay. one and three, I think. That would I, be great. The, so then on, my third on book that... signing, I'm getting all the, the times mixed up, but I think that one is at one and three. Well, I would come, but I'm going to be on a plane to Washington, D.C. because of the Alexandria screening on uh. Sunday the 12th. But you definitely have to come to the Ronald Reagan library screening because it's going to – it will be so cool. And that's on Friday. You know, so and I've been meaning, perfectly in your I've been meaning to go there for years, and I just can't get there. <laughs> this would be a good excuse to go. <laughs> uh, it would be wonderful. And actually, um, there's a way you can sign up and make a reservation. You don't have to have a okay. reservation. It's free. But we're trying to give the Reagan an idea, the Reagan Library, an idea yeah, of how many, how many sure. people Nancy are coming. Nancy Reagan was a caregiver. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, Absolutely. Absolutely. And would my wife when you, would my wife enjoy it? A uh, a, a care. Oh eat? sure. See, oh I don't, sure. I um, I think we're not only going for the caregiving audience here. We're going to, to we're trying to make the situation known to yeah. the greater population. Yeah. You know, and so what's not, the what's the date again caregivers. at the Reagan Library? November tenth. The Ronald Reagan Presidential Library is in Simi Valley, California. Yeah. It's a beautiful location. It's up on top of really a small mountain. Yeah. That's where and the it funeral overlooks, was. Well, yeah. And uh, Everybody really, saw that. and it's just and really beautiful. It's Friday the 10th. What time? Um, the screening is at 12, but we're encouraging people to come at 10 because of parking, and they have a whole day of activities that have to do with Veterans Day. They'll have oh. a color guard and recognition, and also um, a speaker, Brian Anderson, who's um, quadriplegic. Uh -huh. I'm not sure, but he uh, he wrote a book, and so he's going to be speaking, and then and signing books, and then our screening is right after that. Yeah. But you should bring your wife. You I'm really should. I'm looking at my calendar, and I am free. It's the next day that's the book signing. And uh, that is the weekend of the Chicago conference, uh, Adrian, just so you know if anybody asks The 10th and 11th. I just yeah, looked it up. 10th and 11th, yeah. yeah. So, Adrian, you know, we'll be at our stuff, and you go to Chicago because <laughs> we try to clone ourselves, but it doesn't work as well as we would think. <laughs> Well, I was in Chicago last year. Um, she she is serving the whole caregiving community. This is uh, she's really talking to caregivers more than people like Dave and myself and you who already know what the situation is. That that's really who's attending. Uh, and then there are people like us who go there to present. But, you know, since I went last year, I'll skip this year. I'll go next year. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, uh, and that's definitely something that I think you're right. I mean, it'd be great to screen the film and workshop that. Yeah. That would be awesome. I think so, too. Well, listen, it's time for another break, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Dave Nassani, The Caregiver's Caregiver, has just released his sixth book entitled It's My Life Too. Reclaim your caregiver sanity by learning when to say yes and when to say no. It was specifically written for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but just don't know how. Dave is the sole caregiver to his wife, Charlene, since 1996. He knows firsthand what caregivers are going through because he is one. 
and he now speaks all across the country, offering caregivers his incredible caregiver support package. Even the airlines tell us that in the event of an emergency, to put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child with their mask. They know that those who don't heed their advice often black out, thus becoming unable to help either themselves or their child. And caregivers are exactly the same way. It's my life too. Reclaim your caregiver sanity by learning when to say yes and when to say no. We'll help caregivers who are neglecting their sleep, diet, and social life, and learn to put their needs first. Pick up your copy today, or buy one for your special caregiver. On sale everywhere, and at caregiverscaregiver.com. Author Dave Nassany joins us this morning. His new book is designed to teach caregivers how to take care of themselves first. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. So how did you become a caregiver? Well, 21 years ago, my beautiful wife, Charlene, she suffered a massive stroke when she lost her speech and became paralyzed. And as a result, I have now host a popular iTunes podcast called uh, the Dave the Caregiver's Caregiver Radio Show. Mm -hmm. And I'm a best-selling author to my newest book, It's My Life Too, Reclaim Your Caregiver Sanity. And ever since, I've been speaking all across the nation, telling my message, how to prevent your loved one's illness from actually killing you. Yeah, Dave, this is such an important topic, and you are all about educating people. So what are the top three mistakes that caregivers can make? Well, the first mistake that caregivers make is they don't put their needs first. I mean, the, the airlines tell us clearly, put your oxygen mask on first before you help your loved one. What an amazing concept for all of life. Take care of you first, not out of selfishness, but out of survival. Mm -hmm. now, the next mistake that they make is they don't ask for help. I mean, you have a cell phone. Use it. Call your brother. Call your sister. Call your mother's ex-wife. Call anybody. Just ask for help. You're not a failure if you can't do it. Third mistake is they allow undeserved guilt to mm. influence their decisions. I think of Fred Sanford. Elizabeth, I'm coming for you, honey. <laughs> you know, and caregivers, uh, that kind of stuff will kill you. Definitely. Dave, what can you tell us about your new book? It's my life, too. Reclaim your caregiver sanity. It's perfect for caregivers who know they should be putting their needs first, but they just don't know how. And it's not only for caregivers. I like to say you're, if you're not a caregiver, you're either going to become a caregiver or you're going to need a caregiver. So uh, I'm going to make an offer you can't refuse. Mm -hmm. It's still a line from The Godfather. Mm -hmm. I'm lowering the price of the Kindle $10. So from $10.99, that's a 90% reduction for those of you who are paying attention. Just go to Amazon.com, type in my name or type in the name of the book. It's my life too. And it's just for the Kindle. We have the paperback as well. Now, Dave, how is your wife doing right now? She's amazing. I mean, she makes us normal people look like whiners and complainers. She has a great attitude. She still can't talk, but she can communicate non-verbally with charades and Pictionary, two, two games that I hate, by the way. But I'm learning how to love. And then she still can't walk, but she has a power chair and a van with a lift, and she can travel all around the world. She's my hero. Mm, that's amazing, Dave. Thank you so very much. If you would like some more information on Dave's book, you can go to ourquadcities.com. Well, we're back with Stephanie Howard and Adrian Gruber, and we're just getting excited here about this film because it's going to have a lot of potential for awareness, not only by uh, the general population, but perhaps the government. Uh, are you excited that the government might actually do something to benefit caregivers, Stephanie? <laughs> well, they're already... Um through a lot of efforts with what's called the Elizabeth Dole Foundation for Caregiving, mm. um, they have helped to push through legislation that actually will give caregivers, military caregivers, a small stipend based on the level of disability of their service member. So there's a bit of paperwork that goes on there. But right now, there's legislation in Congress that would make those same benefits available to all military caregivers. Right now, that legislation um, and that, that those stipends are only for post 9-11. So the, the kind of rallying cry is, you know, caregivers of all wars. Right. And it should be. that, of course, is really, really critical. Yeah. Well, you know, we need to take care of our vets because they take care of us. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's a shame what you hear about uh, going on at the VA hospitals, et cetera. But I'm sure you've made a lot of new friends in this uh, endeavor. And how has this changed your life uh, personally, you know? Well, as a, um, a TV news journalist, when we do stories, and I think I said before, they're much shorter. You know, they're 
Um, and you, you don't get you don't get the opportunity to really get to know people. Um, and in this project, I really felt in, in a different way. I, I got to know these people and they got to know me and we've become friends. And in other circumstances, I might say, no, I, I need to be at arm's length. But in this, it, it really helped the film, not only in content, but sometimes at, at some point, one of them would call me and say, hey, you, you can't believe what's happened. You know, this has changed, this has changed, this has changed. And I'll say, oh, wow, we we need to keep going here. We need to keep in production and go and interview them again mm -hmm. and update mm -hmm. their Follow story. Up. And, you know, and of course that involved travel. We been in San Antonio and Kansas and Washington, D.C. Oh. and Southern California. And as you can imagine, that got more and more expensive. And yeah. I never really could spend as much time as I wanted to, to really. But the expenses are just so high. And we had done fundraising, and it only goes so far. So far. So, and that's another reason the film took five years, because, wow, you know, continuing to fundraise but yeah, yeah five years and that's how a big chunk times, of time on my life how many times did you actually have to go back and interview them and and uh, you know the travel and how long did it take you to gather enough material for the film the whole five years or we actually would have had enough even after a year and a half but like yeah. i said we were following the story so we were in san antonio in the texas area Three times. San Antonio um, um, has the Brooke Arby Medical Center for Sam mm -hmm. Houston, and that's the big burn center, and also the Center for the Intrepid, which is a big rehab center. Uh, what generally happened was the really severely burned service members were sent to San Antonio, and then people with other injuries were sent to Walter Reed in Washington. So we had to go there three times, uh, Kansas twice, once again for follow-ups, Washington, D.C. twice. But, and when I say Washington, D.C., I mean the greater Washington mm -hmm. area, Kansas City, the greater Kansas City area. Things, same thing with San Antonio. And then all over Southern California. And you know, a lot of work, a lot of travel, huge it's every, expenses. It's because it's everywhere. I have, I have a, a question. Um, there are two young women caregivers that I know who's, who have, but they both have husbands who are quadriplegics from the war, and the amount of paperwork that they have to do to get equipment and to be able to care for their, their husbands who came home uh, was just overwhelming to me. I know what I have to do for, for a cancer patient, but the paperwork to get a hoist to move, a, you know, this, this man around and give him dignity. And it, it's something that really takes work. These women are extraordinary. The paperwork part of it and the red tape is a, a big issue. And when we look on Facebook and we see them asking each other questions, sometimes right. they'll make a list of these forms, and, you know, with numbers and letters, and I would have no idea what they are, but they have an enormous amount of paperwork. Yep. They struggle a lot to get those medical appointments with the VA and a lot of it just goes against logical thinking, and we talk about that in the film. Um, but we're careful not to make it the story about the VA or mm -hmm. about, about the, the politics. Women, about the caregivers. It's very much about the women, about these caregivers. That's what we did do. You, did you consider having a male caregiver who's taking care we of We tried really, really hard, and... Um, um, I think the, the statistic I saw even last week was that, and when it comes to military caregiving, 70% are women, 30% are men. Mm -hmm. And 
I just, I tried and tried and tried and was not able to actually get someone to agree. Mm -hmm. Um, And it wasn't so much them. It wasn't so much the caregiver, but the wife or Mm -hmm. the daughter was very sensitive and did not want to participate. Okay. Interesting. So, you know, I don't claim at all that this is a scientific study. I don't claim at all that this is um, showing every single possibility, every single Mm. kind of instance, um, example of caregiving in the military. I just, we have five stories that we really culled down from a lot of other stories. And this is who we met. And, yeah, I think that... When you see the film, you'll see that they each have a different story. They each inform us and teach us about a different aspect of military caregiving from a different point of view. Interesting. So where can we see the movie other than uh, the Ronald Reagan Center? Where are the different places that uh, it will be able to be shown? You mentioned um, Well, besides, Netflix. Right. Ne- well, it won't be on Netflix. It'll be on iTunes and Amazon. I see. Um, or it's on iTunes and Amazon and can just search the weight of honor. It'll pop up. And uh, is this free? I mean, how do you get reimbursed for all of your expenses? No, there it you need to pay for it. <laughs> um, so how much do and, you know the price yet or not yet? Uh, I can't remember exactly what it is on iTunes and Amazon. I can't but remember. It'll... We also are selling it through our distributor on our website. So, which is the weight of honor movie.com. And I, I guess you'll be sharing that on your social media. Oh. And also, you know, we want to have screenings and communities. So, in on the theater, website, or not necessarily just in, like you said, I'm sorry, is. I'm sorry, no. what were you saying? You don't mean in movie theaters, right? You mean uh, like in... uh, Right now, we don't have a theatrical release. Um, We are really, really um, hoping that there will be networks or platforms who will purchase it. At this point, it's all in negotiations. Yeah, you would think because of the Veterans and Veterans Day coming up that that people will... uh, You know, industries and Hollywood and and theater owners would, would, you know, step up to the bat. I would, I would hope. Well, I, 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 I can't get in their brains. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not a feel good story. And well, in, in some ways, when you see the film, it, it's, it, it's, it's not going to make you cry. No, there's, a, there's a lot of love. I mean, it's I not know. sexy. You mean it's not sexy enough? No, I use mean, a Hollywood term. I mean, you know, it's not boy meets girl, you know, love and blue. It's a reality show. Everybody yeah, loves a reality real. show. Yeah. It's news. The well, ones, uh, you know. one of the reasons it's releasing November 7th, which is the week of Veterans Day, right. is that there will be more awareness and it will be a subject that will be on people's minds. And there are some movies that have come out in the last week or so and are coming out in the next weekend and maybe capitalizing on the same yeah. Veterans Day weekend, Veterans Day, you know, kind of theme for that yeah. week. But I think our film really is timeless. And, you know, I see it also as having a lot of interest through caregiver groups. But also when you think about Mother's Day, um, I think it be an excellent you know, some uh, excellent film for a network to pick up and show around Mother's Day. Were you able to get back 100% of your investment through your fundraising or you Not have a, a stake in this as well, personally? No, a lot of self-funding that we really, 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 really <laughs> need to get back. Um, yeah. A lot of personal funds that, you know, were difficult, and, and, but I was committed. To, my husband and I are committed to making this happen. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. How can someone get a hold of you if they have further questions? Uh, email, phone, however you want them to get a hold of you. The best thing is to go to the website. There is a contact page, and, and what also is that we have a sign up for emails, mm-hmm. and 
Also, like I said, we have a list of the screenings as they're coming up and being scheduled. Okay. People can look on that and see. Um, and what is the website? The website again is the Weight of Honor Movie. Weight of Honor. W e i g h t. W e i g h t of Honor Movie. Com. Movie. Don't forget the movie at the end. Adrian, how do, can people get a hold of you? Well, it's Adrian, A D R I E N N E at the caregiver space, which dot org, or you can find us on um, on Facebook at the caregiver space, um, and you can email me on the website. So, okay. Well, thank you again, everybody, for tuning in, and we will see you next week. Again, uh, this show will air uh, when the movie is out, so as you're watching this, uh, go and look it up. And if you're in the uh, Southern California area, it's worth a drive to the Reagan Library. <laughs> see it there. So until next time, we will see you next week. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining Dave, the Caregiver's Caregiver Radio Show. Make sure you tune in every Wednesday at noon Pacific Time and any time afterwards on podcast to catch more of Dave and his tips to caregivers on avoiding burnout and surviving the grief process right here on the Worldwide Block Talk Radio Network. Goodbye. <laughs>